Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today, we're here in the Dixon Valley, uh, Ambudo Valley, uh, visiting Jim Vogel in his studio. We are also uh, have his son with us in Sage. And Sage is going to be participating a little bit in the show with dialogue. Uh, he's. Are you writing a book currently? I am. I'm writing uh, a book that goes along with the show. Wonderful. Well, welcome, you two. Thank you. Let's uh, take a cruise into Peñasco real quick, and then yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. We'll let you lead us. <laughs> Vamonos. All right. Turn around. <laughs> Well, the, the title of the show and the title of the, of the book is Folklorico, or no, Fablorico. And it is a hybrid word that Sage created from the word folklorico and the word fable. Mm. And rather than try to give you my fumbling definition of it, I'll have Sage define what Fablorico is. Okay, I think I can, I can do that. Fabulorico um, is a field of study that was created by the protagonist of the book by the same name, Fabulorico. And this man, his name is Elud, Elud Jaramillo. He experiences something very mysterious when he's a young, a young boy. His sister disappears under very, very interesting, unexplainable circumstances. And he spends the rest of his life studying fables and similar phenomena so that he can better understand where she's gone and how he can possibly get her back. And thus he creates the field of study called Fabulorico. He travels New Mexico exploring and seeking out people that have had similar experiences or have witnessed things that they can't quite explain. Anything that's on the fringes of, of normal reality that you would come across in day-to-day -day New Mexico. The book is set in the 19 teens. So it's got a nice historical flavor to it. And uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but he definitely gets more than he asks for in his, <laughs> in his travels. So this is a kind of a collab with your dad. So he must be doing paintings around your, your stories? Right. This is the fourth time we've collaborated. We did two shows around my book, El Ocio. And then a couple of years ago, we did Dichos and Nichos, which is soon to be published. I don't want to give away too many details, but it's, it's on the way. And now, yeah, this is our fourth one. And each of the paintings for this show, for the Fabulorico show, depict very important scenes, very, very uh, interesting events that happen in Elude's life. And he's captured them perfectly. It's, it's a, the, I feel like we're really, really coming into our prime here on collaboration, the way that it's happening is. So is this based off of like maybe New Mexico traditions as well? Or is it just uh, a fictitious story or is there inspiration by the area that you guys live in it's definitely inspired by the area and by the way we just drove over the raging Ambudo river <laughs> um which inspired one of the smaller pieces the healing waters um but it is it's a inspiration based on our area and stories that we hear from our neighbors and friends and then what Sage has done is taken that and expound on it in a, with words. And of course I do it visually. And one of the things like that the collectors will see in this body of work is that I've broken the boundary of the two dimensional plane of the painting. Mm -hmm. And most of the pieces have a 3d element that actually comes out of the painting. Um, so by 3d, carvings. yeah, wood carving. Okay. Yeah. So they're wood carvings that I've, I carved and then paint them to match the painting. And then that, that also reinforces the concept of like his protagonist being willing to be open to other dimensions, mm -hmm. other explanations. So I tried to manifest that in the three dimensionality of each piece. Nice. Well, we're headed to the, to the village of uh, Dixon. And this is where I think uh, was one of your first studio areas, right? Yeah, we'll go right into the old plaza area and uh, for those of you that anticipate a plaza like <laughs> Santa Fe Plaza or Taos Plaza, <laughs> this is a uh, undeveloped New Mexican plaza. Very hardcore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the village of Dixon was settled in about 1726. Um, 
or at least that's when the, the, the Spanish crown actually gave them the papers that said they had the right to be here. But I think some settlers came here before that and established the site. So uh, a, a little um, knowledge to pass on in these little communities, uh, everybody knows everybody. And uh, I think when Jim, he's told me a few stories about where he lived near the plaza and he had a lot of characters that he's painted in his paintings that have given him a lot of stories as well. Yeah, definitely. Unfortunately, I would say most of those early sources have passed on at this point. We've been here 24 years now. And uh, a lot of those old timers that kept me amused have, have gone on. Well, I remember Ernie, especially that guy. Oh, uh, our Gonito? Yeah. Yeah. He was a nut. <laughs> and he lived right up here. We'll show you. So we're now coming into the historic part of Dixon. And Leroy, if you'll go up here between Over the here? trash cans and the two buildings. Yeah. Okay. We'll be passing on the right. That building is the Casa de Piedra because obviously How it's made it? out of rock. And we'll be running over these two tourists that just walked out of Sage's property. Mm -hmm. So Sage owns this really old this one? building here on the left, the this three is, story. This is my adobe castle. You have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I'll get around to it. Couple weekends here and there. Yeah. Well, when I was younger, I used to uh, make adobes for my grandpa. All and, right. To build things. So. And we'll see on our right is the Catholic Church, the Catholic Parish Hall, and the convent. And they call this the new church because it was built in 1926. Mm. And what originally was the old church was built behind it. And it burned down in the early 20s. And then we can go left. And if we look at our left, this is the backside of Sage's property. And these are some of the really ancient adobes and buildings that are actually built on old native Pueblo homes. So this original site, and then if you want to come to a real quick stop right here, this original site was a, a Pueblo site before the Spanish settled here. And then on your right, you'll see the original Jim and Kristen Vogel homestead. <laughs> so this is our home that we raised Sage and his brother and sister in early on. So this is the original plaza area. And used to, like, these houses would have all been connected with other houses, but in time, some of them have been brought down. Mm. Kind of cool. Go on this way? Yeah, we go out to the left. Um, one of our old neighbors, David Valdez, said that when he was a kid growing up here, there was 50 kids that lived in that little loop that we just made. And then when we moved in there 24 years ago, Sage and Grayson and Michaela were the only kids that lived on the plaza. And now there's a few kids running around, huh, Sage? Yeah, not as many as before, but there's a few. So then on the right, we see the Presbyterian mission. So back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, I can't remember when, the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church had a feud that actually ended up all the way up to the Supreme Court. And it was called Zellers versus the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. And that's put Dixon on the map nationally. <laughs> and it was to get the nuns out of the public school buildings. So, um, yeah. As teachers, but they were also the only qualified teachers. And here's the bustling center of Dixon now. Yep, you're in the heart. Downtown. Mm -hmm. And now we're out of downtown. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> now we're headed back to the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah, it's just beautiful country up here. The mountains, the, uh, northern New Mexico um, is at the base of the uh, Rocky Mountains. Um, we call it the Sangre de Cristo range. And it is beautiful. There's a bunch of... Uh, Native American villages, Picuris, Taos, Pueblo. Uh, and there's good little fishing streams all over, all over this place. Of course, uh, you know, it, it all leads to the Rio Grande. And the community here is still farming a lot and using the water and the natural ways of irrigation. Yeah, there's a, the system is called acequias, and there's seven acequias in this valley that feed off of our little Rio, the, the Embudo. Yeah. And one of the things that the name Embudo comes from the, it means funnel. And like Leroy was saying, it's like our Embudo funnels into the Rio Grande, but there's 
five or six little creeks that funnel into the Embudo. So it literally defines what these watersheds are. It's the Embudo Valley is the funnel valley. <laughs> and all of this inspires us, huh, Sage? It does indeed. We just... And well, there's no the shortage of inspiration. The, the apple orchards, the apricot, you know, all, there's a lot of really uh, natural fruits that come and are grown here in this valley. Yeah. And that's part of, like, on the big piece for the show, the it's La, La Fiesta del Abundancia del Priante. It's like celebrating the abundance of that valley, um, El Priante. And it's fictionalized, but I think it demonstrates the whole idea of, like, you know, growing your own food and, and, and building your resources from what you have, you know, at hand, the, the natural water and and the river bottom land. Um, but Sage has taken this idea of El Briante and, and made it into a bigger fable, if you want to kind of describe what's going on in that bigger piece, Sage. Sure, I'll try not to do, give any spoilers out, but the gist of the story is that every once in a while, and there are certain natural signs that will clue in the villagers that it's about to happen, Every once in a while, El Briante doesn't have a winter. And there's no rhyme or reason as to why that happens. And they try to keep it under wraps when it does because they don't want too many people to show up. But every once in a while, winter kind of gets passed over and the growing season is extended. And the harvest that they have and the bounties that they have during those times are beyond plentiful to the point that they're able to have fiestas instead of in the fall or in the late summer like the rest of us do. They're able to have them in the middle of December or in January because everything's still lush and green in El Briante. So tell us what a fiesta is. So a lot of people that live in rural America, they like, what's a fiesta? <laughs> yeah. Is that a car? No. <laughs> so Ford Fiesta. A lot of the little villages and, and settlements in New Mexico and, of course, Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Taos, they have a fiesta every year, which, and they all have, they all have different names here in Dixon. It's La Fiesta de Santa Rosa. Que viva! Mm -hmm. <laughs> que viva. And the que whole community comes out and there's food and dancing. Um, there's fiesta royalty. There's little elections for princess and la reina, el rey for, for the fiesta. And it's just a great time. It's one of the opportunities for the village to get together and look back on the growing season and indulge in and the things that we've grown and the food that we put together as a kid that was one of my favorite times going to the fiestas at Taos. me too <laughs> the, the little merry-go-round did you go right the merry -go -round? i did but you know you did you've covered that in your, your circus um yeah themes but that that uh, merry-go-round started here in in Peñasco. it was uh, sold to a Peñasco man oh yeah who is who i'm kind of related to uh, ernie martinez who passed away mm. um but he donated to the, uh, I don't know, is it the Kiwanis Club or one, one, of, those. one of those clubs in, in Taos? And they've maintained it ever since, but it was from a Mexican circus. Oh, uh, wow. That's uh, the turn cool. of last century. Yeah. So right now we're heading up out of the Embudo Valley and we're, we're just getting into the foothills and we'll cross over into first Picaris and then the, the Pinasco area. And there was a lot of mining that went on up here, which also was an inspiration in some of my earlier pieces. Barrel, the $12 mule, mm -hmm. is one of my favorites. It's also interesting about this, uh, speaking of the mining, when you talk about Picuris uh, and Taos, they mined the mica, uh, oh, right. the micaceous clay for their pots. So if you see uh, micaceous pots in the Southwest, they usually have come from this area. You can kind of see the shine on the, on the side of the mountain. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very sparkly. Maybe Sage should explain where the name El Briante came from. The name El Briante was given to that specific spot in this valley that we're going to see. We're going to look over in a few minutes because it was the specific spot in that valley where the sun would hit in the morning and it would light up this specific spot uh, quite, a, quite a bit before the rest of the valley was bathed in light. So. When everyone got up in the morning to do their chores, there was always this one spot up on the hill that already had light. And so that's why they called it El Briante. So from there was the idea that stimulated the, the 
fictionalized notion that they could have a little extra growing season that expands on the fact that they get a little more sunlight each day and maybe they get a little more than everybody else and so their apples are a little bigger their pears have a little more blush to them the chilies are a little more meaty mm-hmm. um and what i like to do particularly when we're like when Kristen and i and sage are collaborating is we support each other like sage's words support my painting and my image supports sage's words but they also stand alone. So that painting, you could look at it, the, the La Fiesta del Abundancia, and say, yeah, that's just a beautiful harvest image, a celebration. Yeah. And But then when you know, or if you've read the story or heard the stories from us, and you know that each part of the element of that painting is in there for a reason, and it becomes richer. And that's one of the things that like, Sage and Kristen and I try to work on is like making things richer than reality. And sometimes our fictions, you know, the the fictions that I paint and the fictions that Sage writes, they actually tell the truth better than facts. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we are compelled to do is is present these stories and show them not as a cliche that people are used to you know like what kind of chili do you want red or green and but that there's actually depth to the reasons these yeah. things are here okay so now we're going through towards Pinasco, but we're going to hang a right up here where all the cars are parked yeah. there's the t so take a right at the t as you'll see the world's smallest casino <laughs> that, is by fu- Pueblo. that is funny that's cute <laughs> this, this right here I would not have expected a casino to be of that size. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pull over right here, Leroy. So we just rose up out of the, the Pinasco Valley and came over a hill. And straight ahead of us, you see those pastures and the fields, the green grass. Just to the, the far left of that space is El Priante. So if you can picture, we, we passed the the peaks just a moment ago and and the morning light would shoot across and hit that little cluster where you see the houses on the far side of the pasture and they would they would get to get the first light of every day and therefore they were brilliant el El brillante it's like Uh, a high mountain meadow yeah so uh, there's still people living up there like sage was saying we visited a, a person that lives there yesterday and they still call it El Briante. Nice. I don't know how far you want to go, Leroy. We can whip back around or we can go all the way up to Trampas if you want to show that off. Las Trampas? Yeah. The old church. That's uh, being restored by yeah. Victor. Victor. I think there's some artifacts in there from my grandfather. Oh, yeah. Well, Carved in the 17... Uh, bultos or retablos? Uh-huh. Maybe a screen, I don't know. I'm part of the elder screen, maybe. Yeah, we're not we're not able to go in there and photograph anything. No. But uh, yeah, there's all these little um, Catholic churches scattered out throughout these mountain towns, all the way around Taos, Penasco, Dixon. A lot of artisans over the years uh, carved and painted things like the Stations of the Cross and things of that nature. Patron saints. Yep. So now we'll drop into that valley that is the home to El Briante, and this is Chummy Saul. So Sage, do you want to share real quick the story of Our Lady of Quietude, of like her presence and why she is painted the way I painted her? Yeah, that's that's one of my favorites. So the painting Our Lady of Quietude depicts a young lady named Marisol, who since birth has always preferred standing outside in the sun uh, to the point where she misses meals, she spends days and nights out there in a row. She basically spent her entire life standing out in the sun in the same way that a tree does or flowers do. And word of her spreads around in the surrounding communities and she, at a certain point, develops a folk saint following, much to the much to her parents' discontent. So she gets a lot of pilgrims that come and visit her and come to worship at her feet. And 
hope that they can get some sort of divine blessing from her just because she's so at peace. And my favorite part about the title of that painting and the story itself is that quieta or quieto in Spanish means still and not just quiet. So quietude in that in that aspect is perfectly describes exactly what she is. She's a still woman who spends her whole life in such great peace that she gets a religious following as a result. When I painted her, I, I wanted to convey that stillness. So I thought if a person was so still that the, the birds, those are house finches in the painting, are comfortable enough to actually come and build their nest in her hand and, and roost on her and, and give her like the sense that she's a tree. And then part of it also was just the fun of carving the little house finches that are only about an inch and a half inch they're, tall. They're beautiful. Thank, Thank you. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I have a sister named Mighty Soy. Do you? Mm -hmm. Which number is that? <laughs> yeah, being one of 11. Uh, she's number... You have to count. Five. Yeah. yeah five. <laughs> but she, she's uh, natured like your story. Uh, she has the same disposition. Um, what does Marisol mean? Well, it depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite interpretation of it is uh, sea and sun. Yep. But uh, according to the history, that wasn't the original meaning. It was one of the offshoots of Maria. Uh, oh. But I really like that more creative interpretation of it because it's so fitting. It's a beautiful name. I've been, I've been waiting to use that name in a story for a while. And this was the perfect opportunity. So now we're at a, we're at, like you can tell, we're in high, high pines, pretty high point. And if you look over to the left, those are all the, the Truchas peaks. And just below them, you'll see the area they call El Valle, which obviously means the valley. But again, it's just another, like Leroy describing, a little cluster of homes, a little village up high in the mountains of uh, the Sangre de Cristos. And people, even though they may have cell phones and satellite TV, they're still doing things the old way. And not just because they're stuck in the old ways, but because that has been proven to be the right way to do things. And so a lot of times these like cultural artifacts, they're not there for us to just look at in a museum or in a, a history book and go, oh, that's the way it was. But we need to remember Oh, that's the way it is, and it it, sh it is carried forward not for other people's entertainment or our education, but just because that's the right way to do something. Well, they've survived in this high mountain communities for a long time, so it is the way. I'm glad you made that point. I think it's important to recognize that these are living communities with living languages and living cultures. It's not something archaic. It kind of bothers me. This fun fact that people love to throw around, they say, oh, New Mexico Spanish is archaic Spanish. Yeah. And it's, it, it's really not. There are archaic words included, but it's, it's a living language. And there's more influences beyond just, just archaic Spanish.